Hi everyone, welcome. We're just sorting last minute technical quirks. Uh, we'll be right with you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'd love for you to engage with us. So tell us where you're dialing in from. Uh, what part of the world are you sitting in? I am currently in Oslo, Norway. So please feel free to drop your location in the chat. Emil, where are you dialing in from? I know, but you know, just for the audience. So I'm joining from uh, from Copenhagen today, uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, just in case hey. there's confusion with a couple of US American Copenhagens. <laughs> I'm joining uh, all the way from New York today. So, uh, what time is it, Justin? It is seven o'clock in the morning. So instead of the afternoon coffee, I'm having the morning coffee. Thank you so much for making the time to be here and waking up early to do so. Of course. Yeah. I'm joining you guys from um, from Brussels in Belgium. But I'm originally Hungarian, which I think maybe Emil was also based on your name. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, and we have people from Michael from Copenhagen, London, UK, Copenhagen, Brussels, Stockholm, London, London. Wonderful. And Natalie, you are in. I drew. I drew blank. I know where you are, but where are you? Can you tell us? I, I came back, but I was uh, in Austria a couple of days ago, and we came back early due to better weather here than in Austria. So uh, we're back in uh, in Hernefoss, little, little Hernefoss. Yes, Hernefoss, Norway. Yes. Okay, um, so normally we wait until about five past to get started to let people who are running late come in. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm just going to do some housekeeping. And I'm hoping I don't forget any of the housekeeping. Um, today we have a very interesting and nuanced conversation happening. Uh, we welcome you to uh, uh, include questions or comments in the chat. Our chats tend to have its the, uh, a life of its own normally because people have conversations on there. Uh, we ask that you mute yourself so we don't uh, we're not distracted by say background noise. Um, but during the conversation, if something comes up for you, please toss it in in the chat, be it a comment or a question. If it's a question that you want to direct to a particular person um, on the panel, please preface with saying Emil, Justin, Chisum, or Natalie. Um, if it's a question for everyone, then you can just drop it in as a question. And then the lucky person I point to will have to answer it. Uh, or if we have a volunteer. Um, what else? I think Okay, and also we are live streaming on LinkedIn. It's important to also clarify that only the uh, uh, the panelists as, who are spotlighted will be visible on LinkedIn. So we welcome you to open uh, or to have your video on so you interact with us. So we're not just talking to like, you know, names on the screen. Um, trying to think of anything else. I think that covers most of it. If not, please, one of my team toss in uh, any other thing I have forgotten to include. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, uh, introducing myself and then I will call on the panelists to introduce themselves. Also worth clarifying that we would normally and we would do today as well, uh, describe our surroundings and our backgrounds. Uh, we do this to be more inclusive of people who are vis uh, visibly impaired, for example. Um, what else? I think that's about it. Today I'm having a little bit of a, a, a slow day. I have my child 
who is eight week old downstairs crying. So it stresses me out. I'm going to try to like walk through this. It is possible that at some point I might have to go off screen just momentarily when somebody else is speaking, uh, if I need to put them in the right position to breastfeed. Uh, so that's what's happening on this part. Uh, but I'm going to get started uh, and thank everyone for being here. My name is Chiso Mudeze. I'm the founder of Diversify. Uh, I am an economist and a DEIB strategist, consultant, and enthusiast. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this conversation, which is one very close to my heart. Uh, uh, and we're looking into uh, LGBTQIA plus inclusion today and the different nuances that we need to acknowledge. Um, to describe myself, I am a Black woman, brown skin. Uh, I have uh, a twist with some white-ish highlights, uh, Black hair. Um, I am wearing a red earring that I, I'm really terrible at describing things that kind of tussles uh, when I move. Uh, my background today is actually less boring than what it normally is, because normally I have this like plain white wall. Uh, today I have one that is kind of interesting. Uh, it says Nordic Talks uh, in an inverted way. This is because uh, we are, are collaborating with Nordic Talks to amplify um, listenership, so to say, of our panel discussions. So if they find that it fits within their remit, they could spread it to uh, 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 their larger network because we think this, import this conversation is important. So we'd love to see them uh, spread it within their networks. Um, and I'm trying to describe what else. I am wearing a jean uh, jacket with a, oh, is this pink? With a pinkish dress. Um, so, okay, that's me. I'm going to let somebody else talk while I catch my breath. So I'm going to ask Emil to introduce himself. Yes, thank you so much, Chisan. Um, so yeah, my name is Emil. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I am a... DIB and social impact uh, strategist um, and uh, researcher. And yeah, uh, I'm originally from Hungary, but I'm calling today, as I already mentioned before, from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, because this is where I, where I live um, with my partner and two cats. And uh, as for my appearance, I am a white transgender man um, with somewhat wild-ish, wavy curly hair uh, sticking in any and all directions. Thank you for the humidity uh, <laughs> in, this, in this country. Um, I have um, some facial hair that I am very proud of. It's coming in now. <laughs> and uh, I'm wearing, um, I'm wearing uh, glasses, um, the like gold colored um, thin train glasses and I'm sitting in front of a white wall um, to my, I don't know where left and right is. So to my right, question mark, sorry. On one side, I, we have like the very famous Ikea lamp that I think pretty much anybody in this house, in this country has in their household. And then uh, behind me, I have just like a couple of uh, pictures on the wall uh, with stars and apricots, a bit of a rainbow, which is also very nice, um, yeah. And I'm wearing a, a light pink t-shirt with a bunch of sea creatures that will not be very visible because I'm sitting a bit low. <laughs> Thanks, Emil. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Justin to introduce themselves. Hi, friends. Uh, my name is Justin Hester. My pronouns are they and them. Uh, I identify as a transgender, non-binary, queer person. Um, I am Cognite's vice president of customer value uh, insights in industries, which is a fancy word to say, uh, a team that, that deals with customers and works with customers on a daily basis, um, which is really cool. Uh, to describe my environment, I am in a meeting room in New York City. Uh, behind me, I have windows uh, looking off into the city skyline. Uh, occasionally, you might see a building behind me. To describe myself, um, I am a 
uh, as I said, a, a white non-binary individual, uh, also with hair going everywhere because of the humidity in this country as well. Uh, so uh, even though I tried to do it twice this morning, the hair product is no match uh, for the humidity. I too am wearing glasses. My rims are, are thicker and uh, uh, also have facial hair with the gray showing through from the stresses of life. Uh, and and uh, I am wearing a blue button up short sleeve shirt with cute little French bulldogs on it. Um, and uh, and uh, I do not have whales uh, who are rightfully trying to break up the yachts uh, in the ocean like you do. Uh, so I think I think I messed that one up uh, next time solidarity with the whales. Thanks, Justin. And next, Natalie. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Just to be inclusive, to say hello to everybody. Uh, so my name is Natalie Hawkinstar. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I work for Amazon Web Services as a uh, sales. Um, that's my daytime job. As my evening job, I am co-leading Glamazon, which is the LGBTQ plus arm uh, of AWS and Amazon, where we are protecting and supporting the rights of um, rainbow families and rainbow members. At the same time, I'm also a board member of Women at and Ben, the Black Employee Network, both at AWS and Amazon in the Nordics. Um, for myself, I'm a mother of uh, three beautiful children where my youngest one is uh, trans. Um, me, myself, I'm also a member of the rainbow family by being pansexual. Um, where you get a lot of those crazy questions, uh, but we will dive deeper into that afterwards. Um, the room that I'm sitting in is my office, so you will see a lot of books and folders in the background and some screens. What you cannot see um, is the dogs that are lying at my feet, but you might hear them, so apologize in forehand before that. Um, for me, I'm a white woman um, with some tan. I'm wearing glasses as well and a blue buttoned linen shirt. My hair looks um, very dark, but yes, there is some gray to be discovered in there as well. So solidarity to you, Justin, for that. Um, no whales on my side either, but um, I'm very much looking forward to doing this panel discussion um, with all of you. And please, if you have any questions, comments, remarks, let them come. Wonderful. I am looking forward to this panel uh, as well. So I'm going to dive right into it. Um, so the question is, in light of the concerning anti, well, concerning rise in anti-LGBTQIA plus rhetoric in recent times, what do you think is the reason for this change in the past few years? Uh, so I'm going to start with Emil. I, I think that it's very hard to pinpoint um, one exact reason. Um, I think that for me, uh, what seems to coincide with it all is a lot of visibility. Uh, and that people have started to, to talk um, like in an effort to normalize queer people existing as such, um, people have like really started to, to cite our existence in a lot of different conversations. And I think that there is a lot of pushback against that for many reasons that I think we will probably explore a little bit more in detail throughout this panel. Um, but I think that 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 is part of it and the other part of it to me always seems like power it's always it's always sort of yeah finding a group to demonize in order to hold on to power is an age-old technique right uh, for people to keep power and right now lgbtq people but especially uh, trans and non-binary individuals are kind of on the receiving end of that it's because it's because it's like like the trans existence is kind of like a bit of a, a mystery to people so they so they they latch onto that as like something other something new something that they don't understand and if i don't understand then does it have a right to exist and and so it's very easy to to weaponize 
the existence of of us. Um, yeah, I'm sure that other people Thanks have like more to say on that. Yeah, yeah, Justin. Well, yeah. Um, you know, I, I agree with Emil, and I think, uh, you know, perspective of this, as I heard a uh, professor this month had, gave a great lecture around the history of, of LGBTQIA plus folks uh, throughout royalty and history. And there's this interesting thing talked about was this idea of, of um, that pretty much, well, not pretty much, throughout human history, uh, LGBTQIA plus and trans people have always existed. What's interesting is you see a severe uptick in the othering around the period of, of colonialization by the different Western European powers. And there's this theory that the professor was talking about was that you needed something to other to show that you were superior and, and deserved to be the one in power, right? We should be colonizing you for various reasons. One of them is, you know, this idea that that those things are bad or those things are not good. Um, and I think, you know, that really struck an interesting tone for me because I see that somewhat happening again, right? You have uh, what statistically is becoming a smaller and smaller by the day minority of very loud and getting louder, more active and violent um, uh, individuals who who, who quite frankly are losing power step by step, right? And, and so they need to really latch on to these things again, right? To show that this is why I should be in charge. This is why I should have power in the halls of government. This is why I should have power in the halls of companies um, because I am not that thing. That thing is bad. And, and um when the professor talked about this back from the colonialization time, it, it really struck a tone with me because I was like, wow, this is, I think, a good perspective on what's going on now, right? History repeats itself for time as a flat plane, right? That we just go around in a circle. We seem to be doing that again, right? Where this minority is, is needing to find uh, ways to, to hold on to their power as they see it shrinking as, as uh, human civilization moves on, right? In a good positive uh, arc. And I think also, unfortunately, the other thing is um, that minority is emboldened because we see companies uh, who, quite frankly, were just giving lip service or, or you know, uh, performative acts uh, bowing to that loud minority. And, and that is therefore, you know, emboldening that minority more so. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's concerning and not ideal for sure. It's, it's a bad thing. Thanks, Justin. Um, Natalie. Well, I'm, I'm going to continue a little bit on, on what Justin is saying as well, because according to Freedom House, more than three out of four people in the world are living in a country that has restrictions on freedom. And that is actually the highest proportion for more than 25 years. And what we see combined with that is a political shift to right wing and right-wing are weaponizing fear against sexual and gender minorities. Um, just to give you some examples, in Uganda, the anti-homosexuality bill of 2023, which does not only extend the penalty for consensual same-sex acts, um, they were already criminalized in Uganda, but it creates a new category of offenses that would impose the death penalty and it's actually encouraging even your own family members to snitch on you if they have any suspicion. But it doesn't only happen in Uganda. It's also Ghana, Kenya, uh, South America, America itself in, in Europe. Um, we have in Poland in the recent um, elections that went on there in 2020, um, embracing homophobic politi politics to distract from economic uh, or, or the loss of economic growth and claims of executive overreach by the party. Um, at that moment, uh, LGBTQ plus was actually called a rainbow plague, which was worse than communism. And um, what we see now is that a study that was done in 2018 by UCLA uh, School of Law is that inclusion of sexual and gender minorities 
in countries, uh, laws and policies are strongly associated with the level of democracy, and the rule of law and free press. So you would say that democracy is often seen as a precondition for advancing LGBTQ plus rights, but democracy on its own is insufficient to reduce accepting environments. And if we go and take a look at your side of the pond, Justin, 546, that's a huge number. And that's the number of anti-LGBTQ bills proposed in the last year by the US state legislation controlled largely by conservative Republicans. I and have bad news, it's up to 550. So uh, <laughs> going in the wrong direction. It's really going into the wrong direction. But there you see that the political weaponizing of, of homophobia and transphobia, it, it incites violence, um, prosecution, um, that leads to sexual and gender minorities to flee. And we already have right now 37 million people looking for refugee, adding that on top of it for something that is totally not needed. And countries that are more inclusive of LGBTQ minorities are also more economically prosperous because they ensure that everybody has the opportunity to maximize their potential. It has a cost, both human and financial. Right. I think I I have issues with democracy, but I don't think this is the conversation for it because just just if you come from a country where 51% of the people say, you know, we hate gay people, that is democracy if they vote, right? So just it ha it's not perfect, uh, you know, in a sense, because oh, oh, yes, I'm not gonna get into it. But I do want to continue in continue on from that uh, and ask Emil, do you think it matters how workplaces or leaders respond to these ch changes? And I would love a quick answer because we have to move on. And I have to ask Justin the next question. Mm -hmm. So you mean like uh, how workplaces themselves like sort of support their own LGBT employees? Or oh, how, how they respond to, you know, uh, either how they support the, their employees or also how the yeah. response is currently happening in the world, right? Yeah. At some point we talked about Thorn Hotels and how they uh, uh, reacted or did not react yeah. to Pride. Yeah, I think that, I think that, so here's like a whole like blessing and a curse kind of situation for me because, because the thing is that I personally find the, the, the level of, and the amount of social power that companies uh, hold in society, absolutely unreal and not, not always a good thing. Most of the time, not a good thing. But I will say that in this, in this specific case, and not to, not to say that like, oh, we can totally endorse it now because it would benefit me or whatever. Like, that's not my point. But here's the thing that like the system is that is, it, as, is as it is right now. And when companies react um, to these to these societal like changes and to the to this pushback from this very very vocal very loud um be the minority but still very loud very vocal very powerful um if they if they react with like giving in then that just gives them more power right that just gives them more power and 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 workplaces can react in multiple different ways to 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 things that happen now like what I mentioned supporting your employees but I think that beyond that, um this would be a great time for for workplaces to actually leverage that social power that they do have like in many other cases of, of social marginalization when it comes to other groups as well to just like step up and say not at this company because you know we do not partake in that and here's how we support internally here's how we support it externally here is where we put our money and hopefully it is where our mouth is and yeah, so I, I think that it's it, this is a very, very complex one to me. Um, but I think that I think that companies essentially just like giving in and pulling back and being like, oh well, never mind, we're not gonna touch that with a 10-foot pole. 
uh, is an extremely destructive force right now. Um, right. So yeah. Thank you. If that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Absolutely. Justin, what should companies not do? How long do we have on this? Uh, <laughs> on this uh, so I think a, a couple things, right, that companies should not do. Um, the first is companies really need to not talk out of both sides of their mouth or both sides of their of their uh, financial power or political power. Uh, one of the uh, unfortunate examples that I can give um, from America is is Target, right? You know, uh, claiming to be very supportive of the community, releasing a lot of pride product and then pulling it back, right? That's the part of the news that that most people are aware of. The part that doesn't make it into the news is that Target is one of the largest supporters of conservative politicians financially in America. And I realize that in not all countries can companies give to politicians, but it's a great example to show how on one side you have this performative claimed act, right? But then on the other side, they're not actually acting, right? Uh, kind of to Emil's point, right? They're not, they're actually using their power in, in a poor way. So I would say, first off, um, we, companies really have to stop taking both sides of the issue, right? Um, you, you really need to, to pick a side, right? So again, talking about the, the um, issue with the hotels in the Nordics, uh, on one hand, I'm grateful that they reversed, right, their decision, but it, it's fairly hollow, right, in the sense that the reason they, they did that is because of, you know, they saw a actual movement in, in their income statement, right? So am I happy they moved? Yes. Am I happy that they were forced into it? Yes. Do I believe that they believe their, their new stance? No, I don't. Right. Um, and, and I certainly personally won't be staying at those, those hotels because of that. Um, I think the other thing companies need to not do is not give oxygen to uh, some of these other viewpoints. Right. So you hear uh, there's a, a, a position of companies saying or not companies of people saying, well, this is a political topic. This is an opinion. I'm sorry, it's not. It's not a political issue. It's a human rights issue. It's not a a um, it's not a a uh, opinion. My existence is not an opinion. I am here. I can assure you I exist. Um, the, you know, there's no opinion around that. And I think companies need to, to need to stop providing oxygen to that. Um, one of the one of my favorite quotes of celebrities, for those who don't know, is in the '90s you had Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey, both absolute superstars, right? But most people don't remember they also had kind of a competition and and between each other. They did not like each other. Wow, they did not like each other. Um, and and interesting. So so. Uh, Mariah Carey goes on this famous interview show, talks some shade about Whitney Houston, right? And then it's not good and makes headlines, these kind of things. Next week, Whitney Houston comes on and the interviewer says, well, um, you know, Mariah was on and, uh, and uh, she's doing well. And Whitney Houston goes, oh, that's good. And, and then uh, uh, the interviewer says, well, what do you think about Mariah Carey? And I love Whitney Houston's response, deadpan. She goes, I don't, I don't. Not, oh, it, it upset me. No, it didn't really, but I don't. Just, I don't think of her. I, it's not even in my head. Took away the notion that this even ran in her head. And I think companies need to start, you know, in the, in the positive, what can you do? What should you stop doing? Stop giving oxygen. But the, what can you do? And the actual thing is, as a company, you could start holding policies that saying, I don't, we don't think of this as a political issue. We don't think this is a debatable issue. We, we, we will not entertain that opinion, right? Because it is an opinion and not based in reality. Reality is these people exist. The reality is these people need to be included. The reality is there are lots of human rights issues going on and we're just not going to give oxygen to to these other things. So um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of other things. Like I said, how much time do we have? But I think actionably something you can take away, everyone on this call is go back to your company and say, first things first, we're gonna be 
very clear, we are not going to entertain uh, this, this uh, bigoted opinion. It's, 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 we're not going to think of it. Thanks, Justin. And you actually had kind of answered my follow-up question for you. So I want to turn to Natalie and pose a question about, is performative allyship better than nothing? Uh, especially because recently we've seen, you know, I think last year or the year before, a lot of companies were, let's call it pink washing, right? And this year we've seen a lot of them actually decide to not do anything. And so it's looking at the situation of, and, I, and you know, I also want uh, Emil and Justin to pitch in here, but Natalie, just thinking about it from this perspective, it's like we, uh, what's the word? like moving backwards, so to say. So is performative, performative allyship better than nothing? You're on mute. Thank you for calling that out. I think it's very scary what we see right now because if we take a look onto the social media postings from last year, majority, as you said, were calling out the inauthentic, companies that were supporting pride and this year just in the month of may alone there has been more than 15,000 postings of negative comments on companies supporting pride and that's scary and i think as a company we have a social responsibility to protect and stand up to our employees, to their families, and basically say, like Justin says, I do not want to give this oxygen. You come to work as who you truly are. We hired you for who you truly are. And companies who understand that that type of diversity will actually make them survivors, make them supporters of human rights, those are the ones that I for sure want to be working for. I think it's really interesting. Uh, um, I've noticed because this month I've had a few runs on LinkedIn, as I call it, uh, on the need for LGBTQIA plus inclusion. And I have actually noticed that every single time I make a post, I either have someone like a couple of people come at me uh, in, in the direct messages or I lose a lot of connections. And I find it quite interesting. And I mean, I, I'm not stopping. I'm, you know, it's like the someone in my uh one of on my on my team said something today about the trash takes out itself, so to say. So I'm quite happy to have that happen. But it's interesting to see how much hate proliferates and it were almost in a globalization of hate right now, where if you identify as being inclusive of the fundamental human rights of the person next to you, then you're, you're a problem and you're something that should be avoided and removed. I find it ridiculous, but I think it's also for me, at least the way I reflect on it, refreshing because I don't also want to be connected to those people who have those kind of views. Um, but Justin and Emil, do you have anything to add here in terms of performative allyship versus nothing at all? Yeah, I, I would say um, this year is definitely different, right? To to the point, it's it's. Uh, if you asked me in previous years, I would say, yeah, pride washing. You know, there's it's very problematic. I would say to your point of the rising hate, though. Um, everything is needed, right? Visibility needs to be everywhere. Um, proper representation needs to be everywhere. Um, and and I, I also have to be quite honest, I, there's this story that I was told of another software company, and it's a quick one, but it shows that even these performative activities can have an impact. The company changed its logo for Pride, including in their product. And in, in the product logo changed, Someone uh, actually put in one of the customers, right? One of the customers using the product, they put in their Slack. Person says, hey, you've got to get this fixed. Call the company. Like, why are they pushing their politics on us? 
And that individual actually just got, from what I've been told, destroyed in Slack by their coworkers. Like, what are you talking about? You know, this is not the kind of person I want to work with. Like, you know, and, and it's really interesting because as I've been told the story, this individual didn't respond to these things. And about two days later, goes in the all company Slack and says, writes this great post about, you know what? I'm sorry. I had these opinions that quite frankly, were not well-informed. And I ran my mouth and y'all rightfully called me out and I started doing research. I actually started looking into this and realized that I am 100% in the wrong. Like I, oh, wow, like full sorry, sorry won't fix it, but like my opinion's been completely changed, right? And, and that was only because a software product's logo had been changed. So uh, I think you need to do more than these performative acts, 100%. But the baseline is absolute visibility, right? That's the baseline. And let's not discount that that visibility does lead to change. It just might not be visible to us, right? We might not. I, I would have never known that story had I not been told it, right? But this, every individual matters. So I think it's important. I think they need to do it. I think it's the, quote, baseline. It's like, it's the entry, like, oh, you should be doing it and, right? Absolutely. Emil? Yeah, I think that that's fair. And I, I also like absolutely love hearing about this story, to be honest. Um, I would like to offer an alternative viewpoint here or like a worry more like uh, about the, the, the larger effects of, of performative allyship. And here my worry is, and I, I, I was vocal about this, quite vocal about this on LinkedIn at the beginning uh, of Pride Month, that for me, the rainbow logos when there is nothing when there is no substance to back it up i see that as potentially quite harmful for queer communities because um companies going out there without any conviction without any commitment without anything this is a big marketing thing for them right like this is this is a big pr stunt where okay i'm just gonna totally like put a little rainbow logo here and look at me i'm so great and then when it's completely performative, it's brittle. There are two massive problems for me with this. The first one is that it's extremely brittle. Um, at the first pushback, they're going to take it back, much like it happened with various brands that we saw this summer with Bud Light and, and, and whatnot, like in the US. Like, like at the smallest pushback, at the, the slightest gush of wind is just going to destroy this charade, uh, this little weak little house made of straw, right? Um, and the other big problem for me with that is, and it's very closely connected to this, is that big companies who've got not only nothing to lose, but bad PR is still PR. So in fact, I'm pretty sure that Bud made quite a bit of money on their other brands that were not endorsed by a trans woman. So the thing is that, that these companies with no stakes, with nothing to lose, do this, they put a target on our backs. They have nothing to lose, but we have skin in that game. And when they put these rainbow logos out there and people get angry about the politics and then pushing the politics, they're not going to take it out on the company. They're going to take it out on us. And when it's this brittle, when, it's, when there is nothing to back it up, when there is no commitment, no, no substance behind that, that's when they loudly withdraw this support that at least seemingly was there. And then we are, we're standing there. Queer communities are standing around with a massive target on our back that we didn't put there, these companies did, and we will be the ones that these people take their angers out on, not the companies, because they make massive buck still every year, every Pride season, whether they use the rainbow logo or not, it doesn't matter for them. Even if they piss people off, like there is like a whole, a whole marketing genius behind pissing the right people off as well. And I, I see this as a part of it too. So what I'm trying to say is that, that the, 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 the example that you brought Justin, for me, there is a little bit of substance at least behind that support. And I think that that's where change happens when there is at least some substance, because I can imagine that exact same thing happening where anybody who talked, who called this person out on Slack 
would be called into a management meeting tomorrow. And that's, that's the purest form of performative allyship. And that is dangerous. I see that as a danger. And then I would prefer nothing because at least I know where I stand with you, you know? Right. Um, what you say, Emil, resonates with me. Uh, uh, um, I, I find that recently I've been seeing a number of people uh, refer to themselves as anti-racists or uh, like justice warriors. And I'm just like, you have no business being in anywhere close to the word because you are definitely upholding oppressive systems. And sure, they write the nice things, but I think about when they get into rooms as they put themselves forward into the world as an anti-racist, do they actually cause more harm than do they, or do they do the work that is relevant, right? The hard work, right? Um, so I struggle with allyship and I struggle with the term allyship in general, but I struggle with allyship when it is performative because of what you might gain or what you might lose. And that for me is really difficult on the basis of integrity and values, because like you say, Emil, just a tiny wind blows and they will go the other way. So that as well, I, I contend with. Is it better? I, I think I kind of like the know your enemy, you know, like the enemy you know <laughs> is really great than the friend you don't. But um, anyways, I, I want to stay with you, Emil, and move the conversation a bit uh, forward to uh, 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 lived experience. Uh, during our call, you talked about the exhaustion of being a trans person today. And perhaps maybe that is also something that uh, Justin uh, can relate to. So in your experience, what are some of the, of the challenges that urgently needs to be addressed for trans people so that they can authentically express themselves? So much. Um, <laughs> I will try to, I will try to keep it, <laughs> keep it short, but I do want to, I do want to elaborate a little bit on the exhaustion itself because, um, and we have talked about this before. I know that but it's just, it's just important for me that like, that like, and I know that in our audience, there will be a lot of people who will relate what I'm going to say in various different ways from various different viewpoints of marginalization. Um, but the, here is the thing, living today as a trans person, it means that you get out of bed in the morning and you are a political topic without your consent and against your will. I'm not a political talking point. And yet that's how everybody treats me and my existence. Maybe not personally, sometimes also personally, but you know, therein lies the exhaustion. Well, how do how do I even deal with this? And a very fun a very fun, fun story for me is like like um most millennials i'm super into youtube i watch youtube essays like you know i love them it, they're great and I, I there are a couple of trans youtubers that i watch and i remember watching this video with with a trans youtuber and i was just sitting there and i was like oh my god imagine imagine what it might, what, what it what it's be like to be trans and my partner looked at me and they went like you're you're trans though and i was like oh. Shit, I forgot, you know, because I, I, I don't like for me, it's not about like, yes, I am going to be one whole transgender talking point today. That's not how I want to live my life. And the thing is that being forced to live my life like that, because I am forced to live my life like that is extremely, extremely exhausting. It's turning on the TV and seeing yet another bout of news about how gender ideology about like about how that's the biggest how that's the biggest threat and whatnot and so um natalie mentioned a couple of couple of countries with like you know like ramping up violence against against uh against lgbt communities and obviously it happens to varying degrees in varying uh places of the world but you can see it everywhere it's reached denmark no no questions asked uh, western european countries are not exempt of this either and 
they always start with the children. Oh, we're just worried about the children. And I'm like, no, you're not. Because if you were worried about the children, you would be worried about the transgender children as well. But no. And this is where, you know, this is where it all starts. It's like they always start with the kids. We're worried about the kids. They did the same thing with, with gay rights in the 80s and the 90s. We're worried about the kids, the indoctrination, blah, blah, blah. And so here's the thing. Um, the reason why I mentioned Natalie mentioning all of these countries is because I'm from Hungary originally. And the Hungary is definitely testing the human rights boundaries of the EU right now, especially when it comes to migration and gender. And the thing is that that um, my friend, I just want to tell this story. My friend overheard a conversation between two old ladies last winter on the tram in Budapest. These two old ladies were talking to one another. They were like, uh, I have no idea like what we're going to eat during the winter because the prices are sky high. We don't really know how to pay rent. We, uh, have you ordered wood yet for, for your stove? And it's like, no, I didn't have the money. So I'm not really sure how we are going to afford because I cannot afford gas. So we are not really sure how we're going to heat and blah, blah, blah. And so they have like this absolutely heart-wrenching conversation that is absolutely existential because surviving in Hungary right now, it's kind of hard. And... And the thing is that my friend was like, I, I was starting to feel really, really, really sorry for them. And then one of them said, but hey, but hey, at least they cleared up the migrants and the gays from the street. And there you go. It's, it's that easy. It's that easy. You don't exist. Refugees don't exist. They are mm. political talking points. Trans people don't exist. They are political uh, talking points. Right. <sighs> And that's, that's, it's exhausting. It's so, it's so exhausting. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I wanted to get into that a little bit. And uh, yeah. So <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> exactly. I think, no, I, I think you actually, it, it's in just kind of like talking about some of the challenges. And yeah. I think just you nuanced it in, 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 in the experience of yeah. existing where, you know, yeah, you don't exist. So thank you for that. And thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to come to Justin on about the same points and look at it from the perspective of what can workplaces do to actively dismantle misconception and, for, uh, and basically create a more inclusive environment that empowers trans people? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So, and, and kind of to tie this back to the question, then what can companies do, right? So first off, uh, 100% agree. Wow, it is tiring, right? Um, and maybe another way to look at it is, is we all have challenges in our life, but um, it, a, a very real experience for non-binary and trans folk right now is to go on Twitter, for example, and follow lots of influential thinkers and someone will disappear for a day and the immediate reaction is, are they okay? Are they okay? And, and here's the even more sad thing. So first off, that's the trauma response. And do you know why that's the trauma response? Because oftentimes they're not. Because we follow people who influence our thinking, who are, who are out front in, in, in supporting us, and they disappear from Twitter. And then three days later, we get a tweet from one of their friends who said, I called, you know, the authorities for a wellness check. They broke open the door and they had died from suicide or they had died from violence. And so I would say, first off, companies need to give space because my gosh, we're tired, right? My gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, but, but I think also, um, Companies need to start actioning policies that create this safety. So, so another uh, uh, thing that most people don't think about is you need to start creating safe travel policies. Um, uh, let me put it in perspective for everyone, two different, two different very real uh, things. One, I spoke to yes, yesterday to a, a trans non-binary individual um, at an event. And they were saying, yeah, I just spoke at another event. And unfortunately, the event um, organizers connected me through the Middle East. And I was like, woohoo. And they were like, yeah, that was, ooh, that was spicy. And I was glad I got back on the plane and got out of there real fast. And I was like, imagine that, right? Like, like the company was just like, I don't, what's the issue? Are you connected? Yeah, the issue is I'm illegal here. 
that's the issue. Like you, you flew me to a place where I'm actually illegal. Um, you know, and it's the same thing if I come to this side of America. Um, one of the gateways to South America, if you're traveling for pleasure or business um, into South America from North America is Miami, Florida. Well, in Florida right now, there are laws in place around trans usage of the toilets, which for Europe can be like, well, you got to be kidding me. And I'd be like, yeah, welcome to America right now. Um, but, uh, but think about that. Companies need to have that in their head, right? If I need to travel to South America to meet with our customers, I cannot go through Miami for fear of potentially being arrested for using the restroom. The companies need to start putting in travel safe policies that say, you know what, you know, we'll, we'll work with you to, to create safe places for you to travel through, create safe corridors for you to travel through. And I think the basics need to happen for companies as well. I'll use an example of a, of a HRIS system from a company called HiBob. And I love something they do very basic in their communication strategy. So if you go to their website, you'll see all sorts of amazing depictions of people, right? Of all types and colors and sizes and orientations and dressings and everything. And, and that's on purpose, right? Um, but they even take it a step further. If you go on their website, there is no perfect circle. In fact, every shape is a little quote unquote off, right? That's on purpose. They do that on purpose because as the CMO describes it, is that all of those shapes are perfect. They're perfect in their imperfectness. And, and um, I think companies need to start doing that from the core. It's less about performative and it's more about having those core beliefs. Having those core beliefs where you're saying, we're not perfect, but you know what? I'm not, I'm, I wanna make sure every body type and, and expression is expressed in our photos. I wanna make sure that no shape is, is quote unquote geometrically perfect because you know what that's not beautiful what's beautiful is every shape size color orientation expression that's what's beautiful that's the thing companies need to start doing to smash this notion is is internally taking that to the core um now that's a more macro thing and i would say for those on the call there's more actionable things you can do right off which is you know start creating policies for mental health and safety um, and it's not just for your trans friends and your queer friends, it's for all marginalized uh, minorities and the intersectionality of all of that. Recognize that. Recognize that it's tiring. I mean, you saw both of us uh, talking about it. Both of us kind of had a moment where you're like, hang on, we got, you know, it's tiring. Make space for those minorities, right, throughout your organization. Normalize taking that space. Normalize it. Don't just say, oh, Justin had to take a, a mental health day because Justin's, you know, non-binary. And no, 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 no. It's a mental health day. Hard stop. Normalize it, right? And, and normalize things like creating safe travel policies. Normalize things like uh, gender affirming care. You know, great on Amazon. Our friends at Glamazon push, push very hard and, and uh, provide, you know, force the company, I would say, I, I don't know the internals, but from the external, you know, really push the company into saying, we will pay for gender affirming care and the travel you may require to get it, right? Start normalizing that as companies and that'll break down the barrier step by step. All right, thanks a lot, Justin. Um, Natalie, I wanna to come to you if we bring this to the Nordics. I think that, uh, I, as I always say, the Nordic have a wonderful branding and marketing team. Um, and so I think it's often perceived from the outside as a safe haven in a sense. Um, it is also true that the Nordics, well, no, Norway, for example, ranks in the top five of safest place for LGBTQIA plus people. Uh, and at the same time, it is also true that up to 60% of trans people in the workplace have been harassed. So, I mean, where we're measuring from is quite low, you know. Um, so my question to you, both being uh, a member of this community and having a child who has to navigate the world as a trans person, what is your opinion about the Nordics and where are the opportunities for improvement well, where I inclusion is concerned. I, I, 
you know, I'm I'm traveling the Nordics quite often to talk about ID and E, inclusion, diversity, equity, belonging. How can we improve this? And the first thing I always hear when I start that training off is, yeah, but we don't need that because we are inclusive. We embrace diversity. And I always start laughing because the Nordic mentality is very much, we don't talk about it, so it doesn't exist. Now, my youngest one, um, as you mentioned, trans, at the age of 14, he started our local pride basically made the statement, why do I always have to travel to, to Oslo? Um, I want to have the local pride. And on a shoestring budget, they came together, organized pride, put it out on social media that they were going to have pride. We want to welcome everybody to be here. That same evening, as a family, we received death threats, real life death threats. As a 14-year-old, when you have to experience that, that's not acceptable. If you then make the statement that the Nordic brands itself as a safe haven, it doesn't. Yes, you could easily say that the police acted very quickly onto it. And by the end or very early morning hours the next day, they had somebody arrested. But still the Nordic culture, the Nordic environment is not accepting. And they have done a, a recent research and it actually even shows that 10.5% of the Norwegian population basically are disgusted by the thought, just the thought of gay men. And 17.3% of the Norwegian population disagrees that the LGBTQ plus communities should have the same rights as heterosexuals. Those, for me, those are very scary numbers. As a pansexual, you know, yes, I can, I can live and I can make improvements and I can do educational speeches. I can do um, conversations like this and create an awareness. But as a mother of a transgender boy, that scares me. And I want to call out and basically ask people to educate themselves, embrace, stand up, dare to ask questions, but do it with respect. Ask the questions that you would like to be asked yourself. Don't just blabber it out there, do your own research. And basically when you see somebody who's treated poorly, say, hey, this is not okay. Stand up and defend the human right that somebody has to be themselves, their true self. Mm. Also keep in mind that it is a journey Whenever you discover that you're part of the rainbow family, you are not immediately saying, this is my card. No, you're going through a personal journey and embrace that and support that and salute that. Right. Thanks a lot, Natalie. Um, I do want to move on to, and there's so much to take in and there's so much to reflect on I'm like taking all these notes or follow-up questions that I can't currently ask but I know y'all so I can send that um but I do want to move on to the representation of LGBTQIA plus folk when they are actually represented in workplaces and society they usually fit within the cisgendered heteronormative agenda so to say. So my question for you, Justin, is what can companies, events, initiatives, projects that center LGBTQIA plus folk, what can they do to move beyond this binary? Or how should they start in moving beyond the binary? Yeah, and, and let's uh, also be clear, not only uh, do they do that, and also they are always uh, uh, white as well right we, we definitely uh 
be the company don't uh, uh, represent that intersectionality, right? Of, of uh, uh, we wouldn't want to get too uncomfortable too quickly, right? Heaven forbid. Um, and, and so I think first off, we need to acknowledge that, that that is exactly going on, right? And I think it's based on, uh, for lack of a better term, a scale of uncomfortability, right? And what you can easily dismiss other or back away from, right? If it's a, if your representation of the LGBTQIA plus experience is too fairly, or uh, too appearing cisgender white men in their mid thirties ish who are both traditionally or conventionally physically attractive, right? Usually, you know, uh, as society would want to claim, right? Thinner and, and muscular and these kind of things. That is the easiest thing to, to put out into the marketplace, right? And as we talked about that, that ability of companies backing away from it, right? That's the, the shortest distance that they can run backwards from, right? Um, and therefore pushes the least amount of uncomfortability um, for individuals. So I think the first thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge that's what's going on. Like we have to acknowledge that, that um, the reason it looks that way is because that's the easiest thing for you to do. Um, and and uh, once we acknowledge that, I think companies need to kind of go start thinking about, for example, the the uh, example I showed pre or I talked about previously with the you know the in, imperfect perfect uh, uh, shapes and stuff. We need to start doing that. We need to say it's not about it's not about representing a thing. It's about showing the world as it is. It's less about, well, we need to show to cisgendered, somewhat appearing heteronormative, but quote unquote, gay gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And we need to start representing the beautiful spectrum of the human condition and the human reality. Uh, so I think, I think that's what companies need to do externally. Now, how do you change that internally? What's something you can, you can take away from, right? And say, okay, I'm going to go back to my company. What do I do to start pushing that? I don't run marketing. I don't, I'm in the HR space, but what am I going to do about that? I think one of the things you can start doing is historical education inside your company. Um, I think, you know, if I speak to Cognite uh, specifically this year, uh, I'm, I'm so proud of our, our self-organized pride group of employees uh, who, who came together and, and uh, put on a lot of great programming. And, and I'm so proud of how part of that programming was bringing in uh, scholars who taught on the history of the LGBTQIA plus community. And showing all those intersectionalities and showing how this has gone on, you know, uh, throughout history. I think that is one of the first steps companies can do. And everyone on this call can take back to your organization, right? Is to say, how do we need to start educating from the bottom up that there is this intersectionality of beautiful human existence that doesn't look like your pretty stock marketing photo. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a step. I uh, also, I'm going to be quite frank with everyone, if there was an easy button, I would happily hand it to all of you and say, oh, just push this button and it fixes everything. I don't, I don't think there's one step, but I do think education is one step. And I do think um, moving away from this idea of representing a group and instead representing the human existence is, is another one. Thanks a lot for that nuance, Justin. Uh, and you touched on something that I want to ask uh, Emil, which is about whiteness. Um, and this panel also represents what happens in the real world in terms of all white panelists, besides myself as a moderator, right? Um, Oftentimes what you see is that even within the LGBTQ community, when they organize events in-house, people who are represented are often white. Uh, so there's a erasure of, you know, people who are Black, uh, Brown, Latina, Asian, 
uh, and this continues to proliferate both in the community and outside. So in talking about who is not in this room currently, um, what is your view on the experiences of people of the global uh, majority when it comes to workplace and societal inclusion? Emil. Yeah, so I think I would like to start off by saying, okay, this is gonna be, yeah, this is gonna be, I'm gonna try to keep it short. But the thing is that I would like to tell two small stories in this. And I, um, I would like to start off by saying that I think that when it comes to the experiences of, uh, of queer and trans people of color, um, it's absolutely them and their voices that need to be centered in that. And, and they are the ones whose stories those are to tell. Um, that being said, and uh, I also put together actually like before before this panel, I put together, it's a quite short, but still like a list of about like 20, 25 uh, various queer trans people of color that I, that I follow, whose work I follow very closely and whose work I enjoy from artists to, to, to experts uh, in the topic. And I'm sure that if I, um, if I coordinate that, with Chisel, we can, yes. we can send it yes. out. Yes. Um, so yeah, so anything about the experiences that I am now aware of, I learned it from them. I heard about it from them. What I do think is worth and within our rights to discuss here at this panel is how much like with, with, with other types of marginalization when it comes to disability rights, neurodiversity and stuff like that. Here's the thing. Uh, white people and people with white privilege, we have a really hard time decentering ourselves. And this is extremely true in the queer community as well, because there is a very real um, existential threat going on that, that threatens all of us. And so our default is somehow to just be like, oh, but what about me? But what about me? But what about me? You know, and then and when 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 uh, when the LGBTQIA individuals uh, of color come forward and say, yeah, okay, but this is not a safe space for me, even though it's all queer, it's still not a safe space for me. We tend to take that extremely personally. So yeah, let's not do that. Um, and I think that what I want to what I want to share now is two stories. I'm gonna keep it short uh, as much as possible. In Copenhagen, we have the first stories. In Copenhagen, we have um, we have a uh, a pride event that is by and for cutie BIPOC, so like queer, trans, um, black, indigenous people of color, uh, exclusively. So up until two years ago, it welcomed all participants as long as cutie BIPOC was centered. Now, two years ago, they shut that down. They said, no, you know what? We are organizing this. This is for us, by us, our safety. The, the increasing number of, of, of white queers at this event is making this an increasingly unsafe space for us because those uh, white LGBTQ individuals were already kind of unhappy with like some events being only for uh, queer people of color. They were already like, ah, oh, but what is that? So they said, you know what? This is for us now. It's by us, for us. Um, and they shut it down to, to, to white queers. So what happened last year was, and I don't remember his name and I don't care enough about him to Google him. So I'm sorry about that, but I'm sure that you can find the story. What happened was that this, this quite influential white cisgender gay man got really pissed about that. He got really, really pissed about that. And what he did was he went to quite influential uh, and at part, in part conservative uh, 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 newspapers in Denmark to write these massive opinion pieces about how his inclusion, uh, his inclusion is just as important because now he is unsafe because him uh, being excluded from a from from a pride event as a gay man is discrimination. And what he failed to understand, and here's the thing, I don't, I don't like. I mean, I think if you make the effort, you can understand why that why that event was closed. And I think that we should, or should all make the effort to understand. But beyond that, beyond that, here's what I want to point out. What this man did, what this white 
uh, cisgender gay men did was go to influential Danish newspapers to turn the public opinion against queer people of color. And I want to emphasize this because I don't, sorry, give a shit if you understand why this event is closed. I mean, please try and understand, but like, even if you don't understand, what brings you to use your voice, your power, your influence, and your connections to go to influential platforms and turn public opinion against the most vulnerable in our communities? How can you, how can you call yourself part of queer communities after that. You're not part of queer communities. I'm sorry, you just threw yourself out of the community. This is unacceptable. This was my first story. Mm. My second story is, I don't believe in regret because I don't believe in regret. What I believe in is learning opportunities. And I hope that next time I'm invited to a panel where I notice that all of the speakers are white apart from me, I will not be as awkward to actually just bring it up even if you know the panel goes ahead as planned. Because here's the thing, I didn't, but I was thinking about it and I was thinking about it for weeks, Chisholm, and I was like, how do I bring this up? Should I bring this up? And I was I, I did say it, it in the panel discussion though. I did say it in the press yeah. meeting. Yes, yes you did, but already before then, already before then I had the thought and I was too awkward to bring it up. And here's the thing, again, I don't believe in regret, but what I hope is that in the future, if this happens again to me, I, I can at least confidently address it and say, hey, this is what I know this. Is this intentional? Is there a point that we that we are trying to deliver here? Can we spin this positively? Or would, God forbid, the best solution be for me to pull out and bring in somebody who can bring those stories and experiences that we are missing right now because we're missing that. Uh, yeah, these are my two stories. And this is this is part of it. This is this is I'm extremely sorry to say, but this is also part of racism in queer circles. I made the awkward but still conscious decision to keep myself centered in this discussion because I was too goddamn awkward to address it. And next time, hopefully, I won't be. <laughs> I think it's important that reflection because I'm often the person who in my team when we come up with this panel discussions you know, uh, we think very critically about who is represented. And this time, actually, it is mainly because a lot of the uh, um, uh, queer uh, folk of color refused to participate, uh, mainly because they wanted to be centered in their own communities. Um, because oftentimes people of color have the burden of doing the education, of sharing their trauma. Uh, so we did host another event that centered uh, people of uh, color, uh, in that regard. So it's also something we think about and the people who would have been able to participate uh, uh, were not say able based on the timing. Uh, but this is something we are very intentional about. And I think you attend yeah. a lot of our sessions yeah. and you know, this. yeah. But and of I course it... I think it's important to do that yeah. reflection yeah. as a white person, every yeah. single time you are on a panel where everyone else carries your race, yeah. you know? And I, as the only black person in this case, shouldn't have to be the one to state the obvious, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. And I think, I think that that was like part of my thing where I was like, I know you, I, we, we have like, you know, <laughs> worked together on occasion before. And I was like, okay, this is, this, is, this is definitely like, you know, a conscious decision, blah, blah, blah. But like, upon looking back, I still, I still should have just like got them said something. You should say something. Yeah. I think it's incredibly I important. I yeah. think it's important because what also happened, I was recently uh, uh, at a conference uh, for LGBTQIA plus inclusion. And I had to go on stage and say, hi folks, I was here last year. I said the same thing. This year, you're all white, mostly white, right? And it shouldn't always be the person of color having to call it out or call it in. And I think that's what is most important. We will still find ourselves in spaces like that while we dismantle the system, but we have the responsibility of showing up 
and doing that work so the person of color does not have to do it. I spoke at this event at about 2 p.m., right? It had been going on the entire day and not a single person said a thing that I had to go on stage and do it. So I think I so I thank you for doing this because it's absolutely important. Yeah. Uh, we do have 15 minutes and I have more questions so we need to rush through sorry for how much i will rush you now so we can get to the questions um but justin i have a practical question oftentimes what happens within uh, the community in terms of how they deal with harm is when people say commit or deliver a microaggression or a macroaggression, which is really what it feels like. Um, so for example, let's say misgendering someone. When somebody's misgendered, we know the right thing to do is to say, oh, I use the wrong pronouns, correct yourself and keep it going. Unless that person invites you in for a conversation, correct yourself and do better, right? But oftentimes what we see is that when people make a mistake, they feel so bad about it that they center themselves and their feelings and their emotions. So you now have the labor of making them feel good about it. So my question is, can you give us Short and sweet, what does this emotional burden actually look like and feel like? And how can we shift the focus away from how fragile I feel to fixing the harm that has been done? Yeah, uh, I I love that you asked this question because again, short and sweet, yes, that's exactly, you've nailed it. It's exactly, oh, you feel bad, so you push it on someone like myself or another trans individual or or non-binary individual. It's, it's, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so sorry. You, it, it, my best friend likes to say, it's not my job to do your emotional labor for you. I love that. It's not my job to handle the fact that, that you feel bad. Thank you. Like, I don't, I don't need to, to do that. Um, so you've nailed it perfectly, right? It, it's, it's, it's like, hey, thanks for doing the misgendering and then calling it out and then keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Love this for me. Right? This is so wonderful. Uh, but what can, what can you do, right? I think um, a, the, the t tactical thing is get, just move on, apologize and move on, or call out the person you see and move on, right? And, and you have to make a decision. Are you consciously going to do this or not, right? Um, so one of the things that we do in my family is we, we play and we have the opportunity to play on hard mode. Right. Every time you misgender me, you either owe me a compliment or a dollar. I usually get dollars before compliments because, you know, that makes sense. Uh, but uh, 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 I think that's important, right? You either are in on it and you're going to find a way to fix it for yourself or you're not. And I can't do it for you. Stop asking non-binary and trans folk to do it for you. Much like, you know, we can tie the intersectionality of all sorts of minorities, right? To your point of like, why am I the one having to get up on stage at 2 p.m. and bring this up? Absolutely not. That's unacceptable, right? And it's the same kind of thing. You miss, not you specifically, but this, you know, imaginary person, you misgendered me. <laughs> it wasn't the other way around, friend, right? Um, and, and so you have to make the conscious decision you're going to fix it. Or you're not, it's not that hard, by the way. It's really not that hard, I promise you. Um, and you can owe your friends some compliments and you'll get, you know, nothing, nothing makes it go away better than, than uh, saying that my shirt looks fire that day or something like that. They're like, oh. Thank you. Mm. Um, but but I think it needs to be called out for what it is, as you did, right, Chisa? I think it needs to be called out for what it is. You are shifting the emotional labor to me. And that's just not, that's not proper. Thanks. Emil, did you want to say something? If that's okay, just very quickly. Uh, the other side of that same coin, exactly that what Justin just talked about is that is that I also do want to point out that I don't think that these, that this expectation from, 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 uh, people who use other pronouns that you would expect on the fly are unreasonable. And I think that that's, that's, what, that's what we have to sort of keep in mind as well, that, hey, guess what? Trans and non-binary people know that too. We know better than anybody else how much time it takes to adjust to something. As long as people are making an effort, I'm fine. Like, honestly, as long as I see that somebody's making an effort, I'm fine if they make a mistake. A mistake is not the end of the world. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes. I misgender myself. I sometimes misgender my friends accidentally. And then I just say, correcting myself, moving on, period. It, it doesn't need to be a production. Here's the thing. We understand. I swear, I swear, we understand better than anybody how much work it takes to adjust. Mm -hmm. 
your worldview to this. Um, and we, so we had to go of... through the transition, friends. We, oh we are aware. <laughs> so, so, so we have. I, I think that there is a lot of grace and a lot of patience as long as we can tell that somebody makes the effort. And here's the thing: we can usually tell. So, yeah, make the effort is all. Absolutely, and I think it's also worth reflecting on how we respond to being called in or out right because sometimes people also try to tone police you on uh how maybe you shouldn't have called them out like that maybe you should have managed their emotions and centered their feeling and do it in a different way you know so I think the response to you know being called in or out should be one of gratefulness if you ask me like thank you I messed up I'm gonna do better no matter how bad it made you feel do better. I'm going to come to Natalie. Uh, Natalie, we've also hinted at, you know, uh, 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 the challenges, say, historically overlooked or marginalized groups face. Uh, and like many people within these groups, they often have the responsibility and the burden of advocating for their own causes, right? And this mirrors what happens within the LGBT QIA plus community as well, where they find themselves advocating for their own rights and for their own visibility. So my question to you is what can be done to collectively distribute the responsibility of advocacy and activism? Well, I if you think can do that really quickly. I, I think we, we have to take a step back and basically say you know i do not always understand where you come from i do not always understand how you're feeling and not only within the lgbtq community but as minorities in general because i do not know how it is to live in the skin of a black person as much as um i do not know how it is to live in the skin of my my transgender son the only thing that I can do is be open-minded, educate myself, and be honest. The conversation when my son said, mom, I'm trans, my first reaction is, I do not understand you, but I love you. And through that love, I will support you. I'm going to be mama bear. If anybody is going to touch you, oh my God, I'm going to rip them to pieces. And I think we all need to work together to create that voice for each other. Being, as Dr. Punima calls it, active allies, not just couch allies and say, hey, it's pride. I'm going to be standing there with a flag. No. Actively work together, understand each other, educate yourself, but also educate each other. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'd like to move on to racism and xenophobia within the community. Um, you might hear my baby crying in the background and it's uh, just a side story here where I was at the uh, um, my nurse's uh, office today and my baby was crying and she was measuring my blood pressure and it was through the roof uh, so even though I think I'm calm and I have things handled I don't because I hear him crying and it stresses me out a bit but I'm going to go to the next question uh, I want to talk about uh, racism and xenophobia within the community so my first question to Emil and then I want to ask the second to Justin is uh, for Emil does pride uphold white supremacy and is it therefore racist and xenophobic? Yes. <laughs> no. So, so here's the thing. Uh, the long. So the, the the short answer is that I don't think that it's inherently xenophobic and racist. What I do think is that it does uphold white supremacy in places where we don't check it, which is in most places because white people don't really like to check white supremacy. So let's do better, hello. Um, so the thing is that, that like, especially queer culture, right? Like um, I, can, I can speak a little bit to the xenophobia because as, um, like, as an Eastern European, I, I have faced some levels of, 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 of xenophobia within, within Western and mainstream queer communities 
even if it's not comparable with racism, I want to say that right now, like it's not comparable. Um, the thing is that, that obviously not anymore because now Hungary has really shown their true colors and it's definitely not rainbow. Um, but a couple of years back, like I had to justify my existence, like kind of growing up and just like not knowing that, that being queer was an option for me. I was a straight, I was a straight woman until I was 24. It worked out great for me. Uh, I'm a bisexual man now, by the way. Um, and the thing is that like, I, I, I came out extremely, like extremely late, but like quite late uh, compared to my Western queer friends, because whenever I say it just doesn't, it just, it, it never was an option for me. I grew up in a tiny village in Hungary with a, with a supportive family and stuff. Like, I don't think that it would have been like particularly bad or anything, but like, Nobody could relate to my ex experience. Everybody kept telling me, oh, Hungary cannot be that bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there is some of that. I also do not have access to my own queer history, my country's queer history. It's, it's been purged, it's been buried. All that I have is this extremely West westernized and often Americanized queer culture that I come into that I have to somehow now claim as my own because that's all that I have. And, but I think that, that I do want to just like point out a couple of that, that goes way beyond this. That is, that is more on the racism side of, of these things. I want to point out a couple of those very, very clearly, because I think that it's important to put it into actionable words. And again, here, I'm not talking to the experiences of, of, of queer people of color, because that's not my place to, to speak to those. But what I've learned from them and what I have also observed later on, once I have been made aware of these things, um, couple of actionable things. Uh, we, the, the, the Western queers love a good cultural appropriation. We culturally appropriated much of Western queer culture from Black American culture, which yes. is awesome. So maybe how about, you know, we rethink that a little bit. Um, and it's very uncritical. Like my point is being that it's very uncritical. There is a lot of cultural sharing in all of that practice. Of course there is, but the appropriation levels are also just uncritical. It goes super unchecked. I mean, of course, there's also uh, there's also very uh, overt racism that with certain slogans that I'm just not going to repeat now, but there is very, very um, uh, uh, overt examples of uh, of anti-Asian racism, for example, in uh, in the communities of gay men, cisgender gay men, for the most part. Um, the thing is, uh, yeah, these, these things definitely need to be called out. Then there is also like this whole historical validation aspect where we are all like, oh, uh, non-binary and trans people have always existed. Insert this example, say white queers that is, insert this example from this colonized culture that our ancestors went in and completely eradicated. And I'm like, maybe not your history to tap into to prove your existence and validity. So let's check that a little bit at the door as well. Uh, I, I have a little list so that I just, I just want to remember the important ones, but there is so, so many. And the thing is also like homo nationalism, Lord, please go and Google if you're not, um, familiar with it, because I don't think we have the time for me to go into that thing is when we are talking about countries and of course, like in Justin's example, when it was like, yes, of course we have to consider the travel safety of employees and stuff. But when it comes to, when it comes to talking about different countries and what kind of anti-queer legislations go on there, whether or not white Western queers would be hypothetically safe in that country is not part of the conversation. It's not relevant to the point. We should be worried about the people living there who are right. part of that violent culture. We should be looking into what do we do to help them? What do we do to help our queer siblings who are stuck in places that are inherently violent to them, not inherently, sorry, bad word, actively violent to them? Because here's yeah. my other reminder, in these regions, in the global South especially, queerness is not the colonial import. Queer phobia is the colonial import. Mm -hmm. So let's not say that, let's not use these as like, oh, we are inherently better in the global north because we love gay people. Because first of all, we don't. Second of all, wrong rhetorical point. Let's focus on other things. But there is a long list. And as I said, there is a list of- If of you can share them with us, we can- Yeah, 
I would definitely would love to share yeah. with those that I just said because I know yeah. like there's a lot that of reflection yeah. that needs to happen as yeah. well and a lot of this knowledge takes years and lived experience you know to articulate yeah. as well um I want to come to a question uh, for Justin and Natalie uh, and then kind of round up so we can get into the Q&A. Um, for Justin, my question is, have you ever had a positive experience in the workplace that made you feel included? Yes. So I, I know um, I, I always love both. Uh, we need to be honest and talk about the realities, but we also need to celebrate Right. Um, and so uh, I, I uh, asked his permission before uh, because I, I was hoping we'd get an opportunity to celebrate. So I'm going to talk very specifically about um, Cognite's uh, president of America's, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, uh, when, Jeff has always been an awesome person. When I joined, I, I love speaking with Jeff. Um, and, and there's this amazing thing I've seen with, with Jeff's journey of inclusivity, right? And so originally, when I introduced myself to Jeff, I'd, I'll be quite honest, he struggled, right, with my gender. Uh, uh, the pronouns was just not even a thing that was going to happen, uh, not in a negative way, it's just it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that, that Jeff could wrap his mind around. Um, and then uh, in December, I gave an informal talk on inclusive language. Uh, to the America's Cognite team, uh, voluntary, just, you know, one person's opinion and ideas that you can do it. And you can watch Jeff change, or you could just see, you know, a, a different in body language in, in everything. And, and uh, the first step of that was, uh, I, I felt, I, I'm going to be quite selfish, I felt so good because Jeff actually called it out at the next All Hands and was like, this is one of the most impactful HR talks I had ever had. I learned so much. Um, and then Jeff actively started changing his language. And so, you know, when he addresses uh, meetings and stuff now, he, he, uh, he says, you know, hi, friends, instead of hi, guys, you know, he says, hi, friends. And you can see there's this little, uh, like, get up in his, his language, you know, he's, he's very excited, like, hi, friends, like, we're gonna include everyone, you could tell, like, he, he, he's internalized it, and then to take that a step forward during, during Pride Month, um, it was so awesome, because our executives gave videos and support, and Jeff stood out to, to everyone in the community, because Jeff shared a personal story about how the friend group he grew up with, one of the individuals came out as gay, and and he called himself out. He said, you know what? I was not prepared to handle that. And I should have handled it better. And I lost a friendship over that. And that's on me. But then he reflected on his son and how his son's friend group, multiple people had come out and they didn't, they didn't, you know, blink an eye. It was like, cool, great, whatevs, right? And then this is where it got amazing. Then Jeff in the video said, and here are the concrete steps going forward for our America's organization that we're going to do to try to reduce bias in our hiring processes, to try to be more inclusive of all minorities, this included. And, and it just, this is Jeff's journey, right? So I don't get to claim it. But to your point about, it feels good to watch someone commit to that journey and get right. on that. It, it, you, you kind of, you're just like, yeah, another one. We got another right. one, right? Like, welcome to the team, friend. Um, right. And so that's, I think, something, and I would say, everybody, go through those journeys in your companies, right? Because there are people, there are people in the company, I always try to act, and I say, there is a Justin in this company. There's a Justin on this call. I also transitioned and came out very late in, in my age, in, in my mid-30s, uh, but we don't talk about my whole name. Um, and, and throughout my early life and career, I didn't see someone like me. So I kept it to myself and I stayed closeted. And now I just keep reminding myself, there is a Justin somewhere on this call. There's a Justin somewhere in the company. And, and if we center ourselves around that, there are so many bad things going on. We need things to be so much better. But you know what? When that Justin comes along and says, you know what? Can you help me try some different pronouns? Just privately, I want to, you know, I think it, but no one's ever given me that space. But, oh my gosh, do you just be like, mm, yes, welcome to the team, friend. Um, so, right. so make sure you do that. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. Natalie, I want to uh, come to you. Uh, 
Um, and I, I think it was okay to share this. If I can share this, I, I remember when I first started getting to know you and um, I recall, you know, uh, um, learning or how you learned uh, or how your entire family learned about your uh, child's uh, uh, sexual orientation. And it was really interesting because uh, um, uh, Natalie's uh, son, you know, announced uh, uh, his sexuality and he, he was absolutely disappointed at the response he got from the family because it was like a okay, you're still doing the dishes, you know, so what? <laughs> and he expected something a bit more grand, maybe crying, but did not get any of that. And when he shared the story with me, I thought it was such a privilege, you know, for him to have that experience where, all right, how does that affect the price of bread in China, you know? So what, right? So my question to you though, Natalie, because we, we, we you often share the experiences that you have as a parent, but for yourself as a person who identifies as pan, um, what has happened in the workplace that made you feel, you know, say included, for example? And then I want to wrap up right quickly to get to the question. Thank you for for sharing that as well, because I think yes, it's it's really important as parents to support our children and to enable them to be them through selves. Um, but you know what what I have seen in the workplace quite often before is that um, turn off your gayness, don't talk about it, put yourself in the closet, or oh yeah, we have an RFP or an RFI where we need to showcase that we are driving programs around inclusion, diversity, and equity. So we're going to put you forward as the gay one. Um, and that made me feel bent out of shape. It always, I do always have to come out of the closet every single time, time and time again, um, which is putting very much pressure on yourself and you can't truly be yourself. But what I experience now is that, you know, I'm, I'm coming out of my shell and I'm not afraid to talk about the fact anymore that I am gay. So what? That's me. Mm -hmm. And when I started talking about that at AWS, in the beginning, I was kind of like, so you're going to have a problem with that? Because I was already defending myself. And the reaction that I got was like, we don't care. We accept you. We love you. We embrace you. And when I felt that, I felt such a weight of my shoulders that I could actually put part of my brain to work and create an inclusion, diversity, and equity program internally in the company. And I got so much support from my colleagues from um, my management that they are now turning this into an EMEA program, where they basically say what you are doing is amazing. We want you to continue. We want you to train more people to make more people understand the importance of IDE, DIB, DI, however you want to call the beast. But it is so important that we are going to match that with budget, with time, with efforts because we want to train everybody. This is in our DNA. And that made me feel so valued where I basically went like, this is the place where I belong. Right. Thanks for sharing, Natalie. Okay, so now we come to the end of this and I'm really going to hold you all to just one tip, one tip from each of you. Uh, what is one practical tip that you can tell us here, those watching on LinkedIn, those who will see this later, on how to amplify inclusion of LGBTQIA plus folk in the community and in the society and in the workplace? Emil, one tip. Stand up for us even, even when you know, you have something to lose. Don't only stand up for people when, when you have clout to gain from it, but stand up for us when 
what you might say is controversial like right. i don't know then you tell your friends to maybe not buy the new harry potter game or something like that you know right okay thank you justin I think, I think one thing that you can do inside any organization, organizations can do is consistency, right? Kind of to Emil's point and taking it further, right? Is not when just you can get clout, but also not just when it's the time, right? And that applies to all uh, minorities and intersectionality, right? Uh, it is, if I use, for example, Black History Month in America, guess what? Every day is Black History Day, not just a day in February, right? Every day is LGBTQIA plus Pride Day, not just June, right? And so I think consistency of your support and consistency of a company's support and message is uh, table stakes. And, and consistency is hard, but, but something that, that is simple and needs to be done. I also have a list of like 83 other things, but you told me one, so. <laughs> yes, thank you. Natalie. Um, again, so hard. And yeah, Justin, um, 83 things. But I think for what I see from, from my kids, promote role models. Um, you know, we all need to have somebody to aspire to, to look up to, to ask the questions like, how did you go about this? How did you tackle that? having those role models out there for generations to look up to and to aspire against and, and really get that push, be yourself, that is so important in any kind of diversity we're talking about. Thank you. Okay, so I need to get through some of these really great questions. I'm going to sort through some of them, um, some things that I think we might have covered in the conversation, uh, and just address the ones that I think we haven't covered. So the first one, somebody's helping me put this together. Let's see. Uh, first question from Maximilian. Um, what would you recommend to people from the community on how to start building their own safe spaces within the workplace? Uh, Justin. Ooh, that is, that is an interesting one, right? Because we all have to do it, but it can be hard, right? Um, I think as much as you can start being yourself and, and take the power of community that comes from it. And uh, so I'll, I'll share a very short example of this. There is a podcast called, Well, There's Your Problem that I absolutely adore. It's my favorite podcast of all time. Um, and and uh, my now a great friend and, and coworker, um, but at the time we really didn't know each other, right? Um, and I was giving a talk and, and they saw the sticker of the logo on my laptop. I didn't do anything other than put the sticker there. And they, and they came up and they're like, oh my gosh, like that's my favorite podcast. And it was like this, this kind of bat signal of like, this is a safe space, right? Um, because that podcast happens to be uh, uh, hosted by a trans woman out of the UK who's, who's quite famous. And, and, um, and from there, not only did this great friendship uh, form, this great safe space for both of us formed, and then from there, a safe space for others to join uh, formed inside the company. And, and so I would say, you know, something you can do is, is put yourself out there a little bit. And I understand that safety is, is always a concern, right? But, but sometimes it's the things you don't think of that create the safe space. Sometimes it's the, the logo of that, of that incredibly nerdy engineering podcast that, that not only creates the safe space inside the company, but, but forms a, a beautiful, wonderful friendship as well. So, so, you know, let a little bit as you, as you feel safe to, to let your flag fly. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Uh, question here for Natalie from Miguel. Considering the new regulations for reports on SDGs, do you think that there might be an opportunity to push for policies change, less supportive companies? Um, for to choose, so I think this question is asking, is there an opportunity to push for changes in companies where they are resistant to inclusion? I think it's very difficult to push companies 
to to be more inclusive. I think this needs to come from within. Um, this needs to come from both the workforce and the leadership team. And there is many different use cases and even business cases that we can make for companies who are more successful if they have a diversity and an inclusion um, strategy set out. And I think most of the people on the call here are very much aware of that. But if you have companies who are not understanding the importance of inclusion internally, but also towards their customers, their users of the products that they are developing or, or making, they're missing out. And I don't think any regulatory is going to make changes on that. That change needs to come from within, from the employees and from the management themselves. Thank you, Natalie. Um, a question for Emil, also from Miguel. I noticed some white squares um, defend appropriating cultural aspects to make way for less privileged queer groups to be accepted. I just want to know what your opinion of this is. I'm a bit suspicious of that as an argument, I will be very honest, because the thing is that at the same time where we where we say like white queers say that like oh I'm totally like I'm just I'm uplifting this group uh from whom I'm like kind of borrowing all of these these different cultural signifiers blah 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 um but at the same time is it uplifting a group where I use their visuals their language their accessories to express my queerness through and at the same time, I am so um, like so preoccupied with making sure that the community is still respectable, that we will do it, but not too much. So I take all of these signifiers from this other culture. I use it a little bit, but I say just how much, because when those people use it, that's too much. And I mean, I think that it's it's very, very, good to look at our history. I think it's very good at, to look at our history and how we ousted Sylvia Rivera, for example, from our own communities. When Pride became mainstream, Sylvia Rivera was one of the most prolific queer activists. Uh, she was phenomenal. She spoke her mind. She educated people. She was kicked out of mainstream Pride events, booed off the stage by her own people who had a hard time hearing what she had to say. But those same people had absolutely no problem appropriating her culture and her friend's culture. And so when I hear this argument, all I can think of is it's not, it's not these cultural signifiers that you have to uplift, it's the communities. Are you doing it with them or are you doing it by talking over them? I think it's also worth reflecting on, on, on appropriation. It's really important to reflect on the gains to be made because oftentimes people who appropriate cultures are also benefiting financially yes. from exactly. the cultures that they are appropriating. Whereas when those cultures show up as the authentic self, you know, I mean, take hair, for example, right? I could wear cornrows and I would look unprofessional in many workplaces. But Kim Kardashian can do it and it's super cool and she's fashion forward, right? So it's it's looking at it from this perspective in terms of also for people who identify as like diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging and justice, anti-racist, LGBTQ pro allies and consultants, are you making money from it? Mm -hmm. And if you're making money from it and you're not part of those communities, you really have to reflect. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a really lovely uh, conversation uh, uh, with uh, uh, a queer organization where the topic actually was on appropriation versus appreciation. And I learned so much also from the context of the community, but also reflecting on it based on, you know, the world in which I, which I exist in and seeing how cultures and things from 
communities that are marginalized, are appropriated usually by dominant groups, and they make money from it without giving yeah. credit, that is problematic. Yes. Yeah. Um, question here. So uh, let me make sure that I'm not missing any question. Okay, there's a question here for everyone, I believe from Mila, I'm gonna fix somebody. What practical steps and policies can workplaces adopt to create an environment that acknowledges and respects the diverse spectrum of, of gender identities so as to ensure that people feel safe, seen, validated and supporting and expressing their authentic self? Uh, Natalie, one thing? Um what I see what really works very well within Amazon and AWS is what we call affinity groups or employee resource groups. Um, but in the way set up that there's always that connection with an executive sponsor who comes from top management, because that gives um, the affinity group part on the table in board meetings where they cannot be present. But at the same time, they can also help and shape um, new regulations that are coming in place. They can help set uh, improvement plans for people of certain underrepresented communities because they have the true knowledge. If I need to design a new workplace, how will I make sure that it is inclusive for everybody without having the experience from everybody? Mm. So have that feedback loop there as well, have them involved throughout the affinity groups or employee resource groups. That is really one thing that I see Amazon and AWS have done very, very successfully. Right. On ERGs, I do agree with employee resource groups and affinity groups. Uh, the challenge sometimes comes though when they are not paid, because yeah. oftentimes ERGs are, you know, people from the ident uh, from the marginalized communities advocating as an addition to their hundred percent role. What companies can do to create more inclusion caring is to say twenty percent of your salary goes towards your work with ERG, and or whatever percentage seems appropriate because it can also be exhausting when you have to work and deliver 100% and then you're carrying the weight of moving your organization forward on an inclusive basis without compensation. And that work should be compensated because I think oftentimes this is why the expectations of people from marginalized communities is like they should labor for free. They should educate for free. So companies need to also do better in that regard. I have a next question uh, uh, from Zuzana, and it says, what actions and initiatives can individual employees or group of employees implement to create a more inclusive and supportive environment for, for the employees from the LGBTQI a plus community? And I think this is an important question because oftentimes we reflect on things from a systemic and structural basis, like the leaders, but it's important that we individuals also recognize that we have power. Well, I, I think uh, one thing that, that I can say there is that, you know, there, there are steps you can take as an employee um, that, that may seem small, but can spark things, right? So for example, put your pronouns in your email signature, right? That takes a couple keystrokes. Put your pronouns in your in your um, uh, Zoom profile, your Slack profile, right? Um, a, a very quick story to show the power of something like this is uh, a friend of mine attended a women in tech virtual conference, had over 500 attendees, right? And, and she put her pronouns in her little Slack thing. There wasn't a requirement to do it. She didn't call it out. She just put her pronouns. She logged into day two and over 50% of the people had put their pronouns in there. The event didn't say like, hey, you should put your pronouns in. They didn't, it was that just seeing that empowered other people to do it. So, so also I would say for, for employees on an individual basis, don't discount yourself, right? Don't discount the power of putting your pronouns in there. Don't discount the, the power of, of just mentioning, you know, uh, uh, that the, the, this is a safe place for your for your queer uh, counterparts, right? That alone can start pushing change inside an organization. 
Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, very concrete. Um, last question here. How do you combine the power of executive sponsorships of ERGs with the need for a truly safe space and community for people who are part of the group, assuming the executive sponsor themselves do not identify within the group? Oh my gosh, I'm on, my video is not on. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why that happened. <laughs> um, Natalie, since you talked about ERGs, huh, can you answer this question? I what, what we have seen is that the way that we do it at AWS and Amazon um, is that as a starting group, you're starting ERG, you reach out to your executive sponsor um, and you drive those conversations, you discuss what you want to achieve. And at that moment, it is also somebody that says, hey, I can get behind that. Um, I might not know it all, but I really want to support and I want to learn and I want to be part of that. Funny story, when we started off Glamazon in, um, in the Nordics, is that um, my co-conspirator, who is also on this call, or she was on this call earlier, um, she reached out to um, our big chief, which everybody knows, um, Adam, Adam Zelinsky, and basically said, we want you to be executive sponsor to help us, to support us. And within 10 minutes, we got an answer back. And he basically said, you know, I'm not the right person to do this because I cannot be there for the opening of your chapter as Glamazon in the Nordics. But I have a VP who is perfectly positioned, who would love to be your supporter. And, you know, the first reaction you got is like, okay, I'm gonna go into that defensive mode again and I'm gonna be shoved off and we are just gonna get somebody. And it turns out that this person who we got was also part of the Rainbow family and is one of the biggest supporters in the executive committee that we could find. Mm -hmm. And just by us having that defensive mode immediately, we weren't open-minded enough to say, we know that Adam is not part of the Rainbow family, but he is extremely supportive. He's a true ally. Right. And just by making sure you have the right people on board to support you. Right. Uh, and I think that is such a great story, uh, uh, Natalie. And uh, um, I, I want to provide nuance for when you are not part of that community. Um, because I, for example, I'm an organizer. I care about a lot of things. And I like to organize for things that make my blo blood boil but I also recognize the spaces where I should not take space. You know, like this space, for example, I have a lot to say, but I rather add, add, just ask the questions, right? Because I need to hear from the community themselves. So I think about being a sponsor from for a community you're not a part of, within ERGs, for example, we come, we get these questions as well within workplaces that we consult with. You know, it's basically knowing your lane, knowing when to step back, knowing when to open the door, let somebody in and step away, knowing when somebody reaches out to you for you to give a talk, to think, oh, who else is better suited for this role, right? So it's knowing your role and taking that role seriously. And sometimes that means stepping back and following. Sometimes that means being called in or out. And sometimes that means not even showing your face. So you have to make that decision uh, 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 yourself, absolutely. Um, now we are coming to the end of this session. I wish we had two more hours to have to keep talking because I know there's a lot we can talk about. I really do want to say thank you to Emil, to Justin, uh, and to Natalie for being here today. Thank you for sharing so openly. So honestly, these are not easy conversations. And it's the same thing about, of course, having people from the community share, which is important. But at the same time, I know the burden 
that that brings just the exhaustion and the recanting or rehashing of trauma that happens as as a result so I want to thank you for taking the time for doing this label for educating us really really appreciate you uh to the audience who stayed with us and those who had to jump off those online on LinkedIn Really thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Two hours is a lot in this day and time with uh, uh, Zoom fatigue. We really appreciate you being here with us. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.